I want to take that as my text this morning from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. If you're making use of the Pew Bible, you can find that text on page 977. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 17, and beginning at verse 1. And this morning I want to talk about who Jesus is and why his kingdom is sure to come. Who Jesus is and why his kingdom is sure to come. And that represents at least two things, or two takeaways, as we might call them, from what is commonly referred in the Gospels as Jesus' transfiguration, which in the New Testament is one of the great epiphanies, or manifestations of Christ. Indeed, uh, the transfiguration is always the subject of the Gospel on this day, the last Sunday after the epiphany. And so, one year we look at Matthew's rendition of it, and then we look at Mark's, and then in the third year we look at Luke's, and then we start it all over again with Matthew. And that's because the transfiguration event is an epiphany or a manifesting, an unveiling kind of event. Now, to understand really what's going on in our text in Matthew 17, we have to see it within its broader context. In fact, if we were to start just at verse 1, we might not quite understand exactly what was going on or what is the significance of this manifestation or this epiphany, this unveiling of Christ as we have it. And so if you go back and just look on the other page, if you're looking at your pew Bible, or perhaps you have your own Bible in your lap. Notice chapter 16 and beginning at verse 21. And it says, and at that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day, third day be raised. Verse 24, and then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, if anyone would be a disciple of mine, if anyone would be a Christian, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. This, uh, this is, by the way, something that's sometimes missed, but this is the sine qua non, if you like, without which nothing is about discipleship. In discipleship, Jesus is Lord, and he invites us into his parade. Come follow me where I'm going. Now, as it happens, he goes to the cross, and then he dies, and then he rises, and then he's exalted. And that's maybe kind of a rough road. But it is, as Jesus says in another place, the narrow road that leads to life. Or as we say in our own liturgy, that the way of the cross is the way of life and peace. But Jesus says, if anyone would follow me, he must say no to himself. That's what it means to deny self. And take up his cross and follow me as I walk with mine. Verse 25, for whoever would save his life, and that's sometimes like, well, I'll save my life by not obeying him. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find life. Verse 27. But the Son of Man is going to come with his angels, referring to himself, the Son of Man, with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay every person or each person according to what he has done. Verse 28. And truly, and this is the key, because this is the pivot, And truly I say to you, there are some standing here. He's with the twelve. And I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death, who will not die until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And that's where we pick up at verse 1. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and his brother and led them to a high mountain by themselves. Which leads us then to this first point, and that is that Jesus' kingdom is sure to come because it's already been seen. Indeed, notice again, 
beginning at verse 1. And after six days, after he had said, Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. After that, six days after, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became, became white as light. And so Jesus took Peter and James and John on a retreat. In fact, as you read the Gospels, you find that, they, that Peter, James, and John sort of um, made up what we might call an inner circle within the, the broader apostolic band, of which there were twelve. 25% of them was this group, Peter, and the sons of Zebedee, James and John. And, and Matthew mentions uh, that there's this high mountain, which is probably uh, Mount Hermon. In fact, um, if you go back even further in Matthew chapter 16, you find that Jesus uh, and his disciples had left the Galilee and went north to a place at the time that was called Caesarea Philippi, which is just to the southwest of Mount Hermon. And he was doing a retreat with all 12 of them. And then he said these things about what it would mean for you to follow me, and you must take up your cross, and so on. And him saying, and there's some standing here who will not die until they see the coming of the Son of Man in his kingdom glory. They were in Caesarea Philippi, and just to the northeast of them, is Mount Hermon. In fact, I know that not just by books. I know that because I stood in what used to be Caesarea Philippi and I looked at Mount Hermon. And it's described here as a high mountain. In fact, its elevation is about 9,000 feet. And when uh, Linda and Victoria and others, some of you who were there uh, back in 2014, when we looked over at Mount Hermon, we couldn't even see the top of it because the top of it was beyond the, the bottoms of the clouds. And so that's probably the mountain that, they're, that Matthew is referencing here. Not that they had to summit it, but what, Peter, what Matthew describes here took place somewhere on this mountain. And what Peter and James and John saw on what Peter calls in another place the holy mountain was just according to what Jesus said they would see. And what he was saying that these three, there were some standing here who will not die until they see something. What he said they would see is the coming of the Son of Man and all his kingdom glory. And so that's what this is. It's like um, when you go to the shows and there's a preview of coming attractions. And that's what this is. It's kind of Jesus saying, and this is what it's going to be like. And if you were doubting that it's coming, let me show you. And he showed them. And what did they see? Well, they saw, as Matthew describes it, Jesus transfigured. In the Greek, the word is metamorphos or metamorphosis. It means to like, what is that? I mean, I wasn't expecting that. A complete change. And so Matthew describes it. Now, Matthew wasn't there, right? It would have been Peter, James, and John, if they followed Jesus' directions, who told them after his rising that this is like, what were you doing up there? Now, don't ask me about it. Jesus said it's just between us. <laughs> but then when the time came that they could disclose, they were the ones who bore witness of it. In fact, we're going to touch on that in just a moment. But what did they see? They saw Jesus' face shining like the sun. And his clothes shining bright as light. I'm assuming that it wasn't the clothes that were shining, but his body that was shining, that was shining through the clothes. So to, for anyone who was looking, it looks like the clothes are shining. But this is sort of his divine radiance being unleashed, which he otherwise kept under wraps. And they're seeing him in all his kingdom glory. It's interesting when John writes the revelation of John as we know it, the apocalypse 
of Jesus Christ, the unveiling, that's what apocalypse means, or revelation, it means the unveiling, the unveiling of Jesus Christ. He describes seeing him on the Isle of Patmos in rather similar ways, his shining appearance. Years later, Peter, writing in what we now know in the New Testament as second, the, letter of, the second letter of Peter, wrote this to the community, the Christian community to which he was writing. Second Peter in chapter 1 and beginning at verse 16, he said, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths or stories made up when we made known to you or told you the story about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. He's talking about this event. And that before he wrote this, and good thing he did so that we would benefit from it, he would tell people in his telling of what Jesus was like and how we experienced him and what he did and what he said and what we saw. We did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when, when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him, to Jesus, by the majestic glory, saying, This is my beloved Son with whom I'm well pleased. We ourselves heard it. We saw what we described to you, and we heard what I'm describing to you, Peter says. We ourselves heard this voice born from heaven, born from God, for we were with him. We were with Christ on the holy mountain. And all this took place to assure the apostles and us, because we're benefit, benefit, uh, uh, benefactors, or beneficiaries, I should say, of their witness and their testimony, all this took place to assure them and us that Christ's glorious kingdom is sure to come. And so that's the first thing. Jesus' kingdom is sure to come because it's already been seen. Certainly the apostles were sure of it. This is one of the things, that, one of the experiences that they had that allowed them to say to those who were actually threatening them with death and telling them, stop healing in this name, stop preaching this Christ. And they said, look, whether it's right in your eyes or not, that we, that we should do this, we can't keep silent about the things that we've seen and heard. And so that's the first thing. Jesus' kingdom is sure to come because it's already been seen. Secondly, who Jesus is is who God the Father says he is. Indeed, notice again, beginning at verse 3. And behold, as they were experiencing all this, and Jesus is being transformed in front of them, and his face shines like the sun, and his clothes is brilliant like light. Verse 3, and behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. This reminded me of what Jesus said to the Sadducees. The Sadducees didn't believe that there was any life after death. So you're born and when you die, you cease to exist. And of course, not believing in life after death, they certainly didn't believe in the resurrection. But Jesus told them, says, God is, describes himself or did describe himself to Moses as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in Moses' day, Isaac and, and, and Abraham and Jacob had, had, had died centuries ago. But God described himself centuries later after their death as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus said he is not the God of the dead. He is the God of the living. And so here's Moses and Elijah, who to the world have been dead for centuries. But to God, they're alive. They're alive now, and they appear with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. And Peter and James and John saw them. 
Verse 3, and behold, there appeared with them, that is Jesus and Peter and James and John, Moses and Elijah, talking with Jesus. Verse 4, and Peter said to Jesus, wow, <laughs> this is like no retreat I've ever been on. And then he goes on to say, he says, Lord, if you want, uh, I, I can make three tents or three shelters. It's like, let's stay up here and we'll... Start with you, we'll make a place where you know you guys can sleep at night. And we'll just stay up here because who wants to go down and bear the cross after all? Let's stay up here. This is great. It's good to be here, Peter said. And if you wish, I'll make three tents here. One for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Verse 5, though, it says, And still while he was speaking, as if God really isn't paying very close attention to what Peter is saying, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them or enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud, if you like, from the Shekinah glory of God, said, this is my beloved son with whom I'm well pleased. He is the focus of my delight. Listen to him. And so when the disciples heard this, they, Peter, he stopped talking. They fell on their faces and were terrified. Verse 7, but Jesus came and touched them, saying, Arise, don't be afraid. And when they lifted up their eyes, because they were looking down at the ground, they saw no one but Jesus only. Verse 9, and as they were coming down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, Now tell no one the vision until the Son of Man is raised from the dead. And so when Jesus was transfigured, Moses and Elijah appear with him. Moses, the great lawgiver, the one who delivered the people of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. He's a primary figure, of course. And the, under the old covenant, he was greatly respected. In Jesus' day, and Elijah, the great representative of the prophets, so you have the representative of the law and the representative of the prophets, as they're found in what we refer to sometimes as the Old Testament. And it is the law and the prophets of the Old Testament that bear witness to Christ. In fact, that's why they're there. Not because they're equal with him in any way, but they're his representatives. They're his witnesses. They're the ones who spoke about him even before he came. In fact, Jesus said famously to the Pharisees, as it's recorded in John chapter 5 and verse 39, he said to them, these religious leaders, you search the scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, and it is they, the scriptures, that bear witness about me. What an extraordinary thing to say. Paul never talked like that. The scriptures speak about me. None of the prophets, the scriptures speak about me. The scriptures on the mouth of the lawgiver and on the mouth of the prophets speak of Christ. And he's the one who's being transfigured before them. The scriptures speak of him, indeed, in Luke chapter 24, after Christ had died and was buried and raised. And as we're told by Luke in Acts chapter 1, he spent 40 days with them before his ascending. So in a period of 40 days between the resurrection and his leaving, he spoke to them. And there's a record of that in Luke chapter 24. Luke 24, beginning at verse 44, and it said, And Jesus said to them, to the apostles, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you. you know, they were all confused, like, what's going on? Notwithstanding the fact that he was explaining it to them all the time, what he was explaining was so beyond the pale for them. They, there was no, he was talking about things that they had never thought about before. The Messiah that they were waiting for was going to come and just take over and set up the kingdom. And the idea of him suffering and being raised before all of that never really even crossed their minds. But it did happen. And now he's raised, and now he's trying to explain all of this to them. 
He said to them, Luke chapter 24 and verse 44, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything, notice, written about me in the law of Moses. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. And then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and on the third day rise from the dead. And that repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. But the implication of Moses and Elijah appearing with Jesus was misunderstood by Peter. Indeed, Peter was attempting to honor Jesus by equating him with Moses and Elijah. In his mind, wow, Moses and Elijah. He's like, he's like our, they're, our rabbis like him. Hey, Jesus, I'll make one shelter for you and one shelter for Moses and one shelter for Elijah. And we'll honor you because you're all the same. But what Peter discovers almost immediately is that making Jesus equal to Moses and Elijah isn't nearly honor enough. Indeed, it's God the Father who makes clear who Jesus is. Notice again, verse 3. And behold, there appeared with them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good to be here. If you wish, I'll make three tents or three shelters, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. And while he was still speaking... Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I'm well pleased. Listen to him. Interestingly enough, the writer to the Hebrews uses a similar contrast between Jesus and those who came before him, and that God speaks through the prophets and the lawgiver, but is speaking in a new way through his son. Hebrews chapter 1 and beginning at verse 1. Long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, these present days, he has spoken to us by his son. You can just hear God saying, write and listen to him. His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. And so he, Jesus is more than just a, a prophet or a teacher or a healer. He's the creator and heir of all things. In these last days, God the Father has spoken by His Son, whom He appointed heir of all things, through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God. I have to wonder if the writer to the Hebrews wasn't thinking about the, trans, the transfiguration event even as he was writing this. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature. If you were to see God the Father, you wouldn't see anything different than what you see in Jesus Christ. In fact, that's what Jesus told Philip, right? Philip said, show us the Father. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, Philip, you wouldn't see anything different if I showed you the Father. For I and the Father are one. One purpose. One divine nature. One intact, holy character. And so on. In these last days he's spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom also he created the worlds. He's the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so God, the Father, is saying to us this morning, listen to him. Listen to my son. Listen to Jesus. 
and do what he says. <laughs> Indeed, what does he say? Well, you heard it just as we began this talk. Matthew 16, and beginning at verse 24. And if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? You don't bring anything in, and you take nothing out. And then when you take nothing out and you move from this life into the next, you stand there with none of your material possessions, just you and your character. And he deals with you accordingly. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? That's an interesting question. You won't have anything. What could you possibly give to purchase or redeem your soul? You've got nothing even with, with which to barter. As if God wanted your money. <laughs> Verse 27, for the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay or reward each person according to what he's done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I wonder, are you ready for that kingdom? Who Jesus is. And why his kingdom is sure to come. Amen? Let us pray. What can we say, Lord? You have spoken. Some hear, some don't. Some hear, some obey. Some hear, some don't. Some say, you know what? <laughs> I think I'm going to take my chances. It is what it is, isn't it, Lord? But I would pray, Lord, in your grace that you'd help us to see it the way it is. If indeed you are the ultimate reality, it's just as you've described. This same Jesus who said all of these things and many times was not understood, he said, and I'm going to die, but no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of my own and I take it up again. And this one, Lord, your son, with whom you're well pleased, said he was going to die and then take his life back. And he did it. I'm supposing that perhaps, Lord, we should pay attention to a man like that. And pay attention to his witnesses who saw him do all of these things with their own eyes and heard them with their own ears. Give us grace, Lord, to respond to this truth and to their message, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.